lesson this morning is much like our study that we had last week on or about substance abuse in the sense that it's not at all difficult for us to understand, though it may not be something that we want to digest. Just as everyone knows that they aren't in control of themselves when they're drunk, everyone inherently knows that working to support themselves, their family, and others is the right thing to do. Brother Robert Robert Johnson gave us two good sermons last Sunday, and in his Sunday evening sermon, he touched on that topic, if a man doesn't work, he shall not eat. That on the surface seems simple and straightforward enough, but for some reason we all know that there are people who have the strength, ability, and are capable of work, but somehow don't have the desire to work and support themselves. The part that seems odd to that, about that part to me is that though these people may not have the desire to work, they still seem to manage to have the desire for all the things that come to us as blessings from work. So, such as food, clothing, a house, car, entertainment, so on and so forth. We need to be very mindful on this lesson that we are talking about people who are able to work, not people who are unable. Uh, y'all want to turn to it. Matthew 25, verses 14 through 29. Jesus tells the multitude the parable of the talents. This came to mind when, when I was going over this study. Starting in verse 14, Matthew 25. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same, and made them other five talents. And likewise he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought the other five, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I've gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. He also that had received two talents, came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Verse 24, Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knowest that I reap where I sow not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money into the exchanges, And then at my coming, I should have received mine own with usury. Take, therefore, the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But for him that hath not shall be taken away, even that which he hath. Verses 15, to each according to his own ability. We're talking about ability here. What do we see? The more that we're able to do, the more what? Exactly, the more we're expected to do, the more we are required to do. Especially, we see, uh, even if we're just a one-talent kind of person and not five-talent or two-talent, but just a one-talent kind of person, what do we still see? Whatever talent you have, you should do the best you can with what you have. And, And multiply what you have. We're still expected and still required to do all that we are able to do. And we're not, this morning on the nobility of work, we're not just talking about our jobs for financial purposes, of course. We're talking about uh, our work for the Lord and His church, and the church which is uh, the Lord's body, which is the Christian family. Verses this morning, the three sections, 
workers for God. That's Exodus 31, verses 1 through 11. We'll see how people who were artisans uh, were used by God to prepare the items that were to adorn and make up the tabernacle of the Old Testament. Workers for self, the second section, that's Ecclesiastes 9, uh, 9 through 10. Though the material things we work for will fade away, that's to say that they are corruptible, we are to work while we are still alive in the flesh. We are to be hard and diligent workers. And third section, workers for others. Uh, Acts 18, 1 through 3, <clears throat> Acts 20, 34 through 35, and 2 Thessalonians 3, 7 through 13. We'll see that our actions or inactions, as far as that relates to work, has an effect on not just us, but everyone around us. First section, workers for God. That's Exodus 31, verses 1 through 11. Who wrote the book of Exodus? Moses. Moses. And what was the book of Exodus about, or what did it document? Correct. And it documented the events of the nation of Israel's deliverance from slavery from the land of Egypt, and then and their Israel's development as a nation. Verses 1 through 11, Exodus 31. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship, to design artistic works, to work in gold, in silver, in bronze, in cutting jewels for setting, in carving wood, and to work in all manner of workmanship. And I, indeed I, have appointed with him Ahoylab, the son of Hezemach, of the tribe of Dan, and I have put wisdom in the hearts of all the gifted artisans, that they may make all that I have commanded you. The tabernacle of meeting, the ark of the testimony, and the mercy seat that's in it, and all the furniture of the tabernacle. The table and its utensils, the pure gold lampstand with all its utensils, the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils, and the laver and its base, the garments of ministry, the holy garments for Aaron, priest, and the garments of his son to minister as priests, and the anointing oil and sweet incense for the holy place, according to all that I have commanded you, they shall do. As we said earlier, uh, in these verses we're going to see how uh, artisans, we saw how artisans are being employed for the building of the tabernacle. Now, what do we know, or for what reason do we know that the tabernacle is important to us now? It is a forerunner of the church. Yes. It was a type, or an imprint, of things to come, namely Christ, the church, forgiveness, and so on. So what does that mean of the importance of those who are constructing it? It was very important, so that's the point. It was important that these artisans uh, did the very best work that they were able to do. They were to put forth all of their effort into construction of the tabernacle. Though it was a mystery to them, as we look back on the typology of the tabernacle, we see why their work had to be done in God's exacting specifications. He made that very plain when he said that he put wisdom in their heart. They didn't draw this up by their own mind. It was with the wisdom of God that these things were made. Yes, it was at his, man's hands. yes ma'am, it was at his point of direction. Accordance read, God regards all the skills of his people, not merely those with theological or ministerial abilities. Our tendency is to regard only those who are up front and in leadership roles. God gave Bezalel and Ahoylab spirit-filled abilities, we were just talking about the artistic craftsmanship. Their skills were not diminished because they were not like Moses and Aaron's skills. So what's our takeaway or application to that point? God gave me talents that you're expected to use and have a desire to use. Exactly. Some things I've written. Just because you don't preach in service doesn't mean you don't live a Christian example when you're out and about and when you teach Christ outside of this church building. Just because you aren't yet ready to either teach classes, lead prayers, or give a sermon or so on doesn't mean that you can't help or work in numerous other fashions. 
such as helping around the building, visiting people, uh, sending cards, letters, food preparation. We also see that this means if your work isn't as visible or upfront as it were, then it is not any less important. Uh, yes, sir. I think a good way to put it is there's many ants in the ant hill, <laughs> but not all ants have the same job. But all ants are expected to do their part. Yes, they are. If we aren't able or yet comfortable enough to do a certain thing or work, all we need to do is look around. We can easily see plenty of other works that we can do. But, you know, we need to stretch too and do that that we are uncomfortable doing. I would. Or you'll never get comfortable doing it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And some people need to, that's, that's the only time they ever do anything. And I'm raising my hand. I'm not going to do anything unless I'm pushed. Get out. Do it. <laughs> Dad can tell you how he taught me to swim. How old was I by then? Probably like six. You're going to swim. Whoosh. Oh, yeah. Is the same guy? Did taught you? the same way. Just screamed at me. Swim! Swim! swim. <laughs> like I'm dying. But sometimes we need that. <laughs> Our book says, as parents teach... Their children about work, they must emphasize that work is not just done for one's personal benefit. Although nothing is wrong with being compensated for a job well done, this is not the only reason one should work. Uh, a little bit further down, Bezalel, who is assigned to oversee the project, was said to be, quote, filled, dot, 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 with the Spirit of God in wisdom and understanding and knowledge and all manner of workmanship. That's verse 3. He was qualified to perform the task assigned to him by his divinely given talents. It is just as important, however, to note that he readily accepted the assignment. Just because individuals possess the ability to perform a certain task does not mean that they are willing to do it. Mizalel was both prepared and willing. So, we should be prepared and willing. Christian families should spend time thinking about works each family member can do for the Lord and His church. Because each individual possesses differing skills, the tasks performed will vary. Second section, if nobody else has anything on the first section. Workers for self. Ecclesiastes 9, 9 through 10. We're going to read 9 through 12. I found this part funny. Did anyone else notice how that the section that addresses working for self only was two verses? You know, working for others and working for God was... Big sections and working for self is only two verses, and I was like, hmm. That's just something that occurred to me, so perhaps that tells us something about working for self. Who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes? Solomon. Solomon. And what does the book of Ecclesiastes teach us, or what was Solomon's point in writing the book of Ecclesiastes? When it all comes down to be a God and keep a command. <laughs> Amen. That's the. That's the bottom line of it very true I wrote uh, Solomon wrote this book looking back in retrospect of much of his life that he lived in sin apart from God the book aims to quote spare future generations the bitterness of learning through their own experience that life is meaningless without God which brought verses to mind Jeremiah 10 23 O Lord I know the way of man is not within himself it is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. Proverbs 14, 12. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Ecclesiastes 9, 19 through, we're going to read through 12. Somebody want to read that? Live joyfully with the wife, and you love all the days of your life. She has given you under the sun, all your days of vanity, and that is your portion in life, and in the labor which you perform under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding, nor favor to men of skill, but time and chance happen to them all. The man also does not know his time. Like fish taken in a cruel net, like birds caught in a snare, so the sons of men are snared in an evil time when it falls suddenly upon them. Thank you. 
This isn't even a part of the lesson. Something last night, all kind of Facebook arguments were flying all over the place. I'm not even going to get into the specifics of them. But one of the things was equal and fair and all this. And who, who is to say life is fair? It's, it's not. That's why I couldn't separate the last two verses, uh, 11 and 12. The race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding, nor favor to men of skill, but time and chance happen to them all. Just because you're the swiftest doesn't mean you're going to win the race. Just because you're strongest doesn't mean you're going to win the battle. Just because you're smartest and know everything that you should know, does that mean that you're going to get bread or gain from it? Nope. Or riches to the men of understanding, nor favor to men of skill. Concordance read, where the book of Proverbs emphasizes how life would go if everyone acted fairly. The book of Ecclesiastes explains what usually happens in our sinful and imperfect world. We must keep our perspective and not let the iniquities of life keep you from earnest, dedicated work. We serve God, not man. The comment, yes, sir. Just say something on that. You know, different people peak at different times. You know, some people at an early age, they advance fast. And, and late and then they sort of stop. And then, you know, you get someone that people might say moving a little slow, all of a sudden they kick in and everything. So you, we, we don't never know. And some people, they, they might be 40 years old, and all of a sudden you, you might say they're, they're Christian and they have been doing what you think they ought to be doing, and all of a sudden they just kick in. And, you know, God time is not our time. And uh, he works on people's and our life at different points in time. And, and in a way, he got to set up. And, and, and not for me to say or do it. Sometimes, what Stripper said, says, sometimes, you know, we ought to be a further band than we are. But who knows, you know, sometimes a person be out front. And all of a sudden, they, the person behind come from behind, and he, he might come to be the leader or whatever. Very good point. Yeah. And, and so you're saying everybody needs to to be there for everybody else yeah. as a Christian family. That's what we're here for because you might be doing great <laughs> one day in the, in the lead and then just like you said, something might happen to you and it, the people that were behind. Yeah. Very true. While living this life in the body, it's uh, easy for us to get used to certain material things to become comfortable in the flesh. That's um, the first Two verses, verses 9 and 10. Live joyfully with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life, which he has given you under the sun. Your days are vanity, for that is your portion in the labor which you perform under the sun. It's easy to become comfortable with the material things we have, but uh, one of the songs that we sing came to mind. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are, treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. So why do we get stuck on material things so much? My thought was maybe because we live in the world. We know that we live in the world, but we are not to be what? Of the world. So why do we worry about material goods so much? And I'm talking to myself. <laughs> why do I worry? Because I have to make you comfortable. And I need some sense. The world says that's what makes you happy. That's true. And you just want more and more and more? I put, I put responsibility on it. Oh, it's my responsibility to do this. And then but where does your responsibility to, to do a roof over your head and do the things that you're supposed to do become, well, suddenly I'm doing these to have goods for myself. So there's things that certain people struggle with. Matthew 10, 28. And do not fear those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Don't worry about those who can kill the body. What should we? How, what does that say about us worrying about material things? Don't. Don't. In a word, don't. I think we need to worry about the strength of the devil in our life, because that truly can destroy body and soul. Yes. Two lines in our study guide popped out at me. Life's meaning is not derived from one's work, but rather from obedience to God. Nevertheless, God has given us the time we have on earth. Thus, we must make the most of it. 
through hard work we show appreciation and love for our family members. That's uh, verse 9. Because of this, we should be diligent workers. Solomon encouraged, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave in which you're going. Verse 10. We must work while we have the opportunity to do so, and the work we perform must be indicative of our abilities. Last section, workers for others. That is Acts 18, 1 through 3, Acts 20, 34 through 35, and 2 Thessalonians. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked for by occupation. They were tent makers. Acts 20, 34 through 35. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Second Thessalonians 3, 7 through 13. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us. For we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. Not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some among you who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Now those who are such we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. So what did we see Paul's job, day job was? A tent maker. A tent maker. So what, what are we to say? That he wasn't a... He wasn't a full-time preacher. He he had other jobs. It was that's okay. Yeah. It is surprising that he was a tent maker because of his high level of education. But being a tent maker, he could do that everywhere he went. Yes, he could. I've I've read several studies on that saying it was the the re- repetitive work mm-hmm. and that kind of thing is that is it might have been another reason why he did it. And he talked about work a lot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Gave him something to do with his hands, just you know. Uh, this section in our book, anyone familiar with Paul knows how focused he was on spreading the gospel. Nevertheless, there were times when Paul found it necessary to work as a tent maker to earn a living. The text does not present the situation in Paul's life as rem- lamentable. So work is not lamentable. It simply declares that quote he worked. The manual labor Paul performed during this, his time in Corinth as well as what he did in other locations occurred so that his per- personal needs might be met to his work enabled him to share the message of Jesus with others. Wherever he went, he was a tent maker. That's what you, like you said. I mean, they needed tent makers everywhere. So it gave him opportunity everywhere he went to spread the gospel. Yes, sir? You know, referring to his education, he would have more like a Ph.D. in today's time. That was, he had like the highest level of education you could receive in that era. And yet, he didn't think it was below himself to just do a common trade. I mean, maybe the society was different then and they viewed, they didn't view it the same. But today, you wouldn't see someone with a, with a Ph.D. doing any type of a trade type work. They would be in a more prestigious position, but uh, the example I pull from it is is that, you know, no matter what our career goal is, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't hesitate to do whatever it takes to get us by until then, you know, in, in L.A. there's probably a million, there's probably a million actors and actresses out there that's busting tables until they get that break or whatever, you know, and uh, when it, when it comes time to put food on the table, we have to sometimes maybe take a job beneath ourselves just in order to, to until that opportunity presents itself. Yeah, there's not there's nothing that's truly beneath you if it's available for you to do. I uh, that's just me. 
graduated college and degree in landscape architecture and worked at a job that I hated for a few months and came and limped home. And I did some construction work and worked on Miss Pat's house. And then I pushed a broom for like eight months. And there were people like, I would start talking to me, like, what are you doing doing this? I said, like, I've got to work. And I, I never, I wasn't sorry for working. I was happy just to be able to do it. I, would I mind doing something else? Not necessarily, but I was happy to have that. Yes, sir. Uh, like Paul had been mentioned along with the rest of the apostles, too. All of them had trade before they started calling Jesus. They, they, they earned a living. You know, they yeah. got out and worked. And, and, you know, in today's society, you know, you look at most big corporations and businesses were started by normal people. And they might have got on up and branched on out where they didn't have to do it so much themselves, hangs on, but mostly everything was started by normal people. Y'all seen that commercial that's on TV right now about all these businesses that were started in the garage? You know what I'm talking yeah. about? Started in the garage, started in the garage. <laughs> yeah. you know. Exactly, but you're very, you're very, I don't even have a garage, i got a carport. <laughs> um, you're very right about the apostles. They were all working men. They were... <laughs> Whatever, you know. Yes. Yeah. Uh, continued on in our book, those who are unwilling to work need to realize their actions affect more than just themselves. If one does not work, he must depend on others for support. Additionally, those who refuse to work sometimes involve themselves in matters that do not pertain to them. This was true of the Thessalonians. There are some of you, there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Second Thessalonians 3 and 11. The solution to this behavior is to work in quietness and eat one's own bread. To fail to do so is to disobey the will of God. See, what, what that says to me, they're, you know, who are walking disorderly and, you know, don't want to work with their busy bodies. So they want to sit and watch everybody else work and then complain about how they do it. Like government work almost. I'm not picking on anybody. I worked at Mississippi State when I was in school and it would always be like four of us to go do any one job, and that's how it usually worked. It was one person doing the job and the rest of the people watching. You need to do it like this, do it like that. Sometimes you don't necessarily like your boss, and I, I can achieve that for the many years that I've worked. But later in that, I learned my boss is, is my God, is, is, is Jesus. I go to work to please him, to do what's expected of me through him, not to please that, that man or that woman that quote, is my supervisor or helps me get my paycheck. God expects me to use the talents that I have to serve him. Yes, Some sweet. mornings I would have to get up and say, I'm not going to work today because my boss expects me, but because God expects me to go. And that would get me through some rough days. Very true. That's the ultimate end game of the, our whole discussion this morning. You summed up that's um, at one of the application uh, points. I think the, the third point. Christians should always do their best, whether it's One's occupation in the church or one's community, one's effort should reflect the ability God has provided. If we truly wish to honor God, we must perform our duties as if we were working directly for Him. That's a very good point. And now I'm retired, so I don't have to worry about that part. Exactly. Now I'm all done. I'm finished. Questions. Was, what was the name of the individuals chosen to, uh, individual chosen to lead the work on the tabernacle? Bezalel. Question number two, what qualified this individual to perform this task? 31, verse 31, 3. Yes, and he was uh, filled with the spirit of God in wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and he was willing to do the work. Question number three, how can individuals show appreciation and love for their family members? Ecclesiastes 9, 9. For that part <coughs> Work. I was going through the questions. One word, work. And teach them to work. Yes. <laughs> Y'all read all the way through all the, the body of our study this morning. That was in there many times to teach them to work as well. That's going to be in one of our discussion questions. Heather and I have a way we're going to attempt to do that. We'll see how it works. Why should we do our best in our work? Ecclesiastes 9.10. Yes, we are. All, all blessings come from God anyway. We're just stewards of it. What trade did Paul work in while in Corinth? 
we said that tent maker. What did Paul hear about some of the Thessalonians? You weren't working. You were letting other people do all the work, and you were probably reaping a lot of the benefits and complaining about it. Discussion questions. What can parents do to instill a strong work ethic in their children? Make them work. I don't know, I've been thinking about this for a minute. Set the example first and, and encourage them to do it too. And if that encouragement doesn't work, then you make them. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's good. I know when I was coming up with kids and uh, our dad used to have us doing stuff. We was too little. And uh, he would say, y'all come on out of this house. If you can't do it, you can hand me the range or hand me the light or whatever. He to just stand around looking you alone or something, still in this sit up in the house watching TV. And that, that, that is a good, a good thing. And you do. And kids really pick up on stuff whether you think they do or not. You know, they just around looking. You think they're really not paying attention. They might be drawing in the sand or whatever, but they paying a lot more attention than you think they are. Oh, yeah. Say a, say a, say a, say a word or phrase and... Corbin will, Corbin will just repeat it. He's over there playing in the corner with something. You say something, and he says the last three words you just said. We, we can see it with Corbin, you know, when he, Colin's out there working on a car or something, you know, he'll have the hood up, and Corbin goes, engine. You know? Like, I didn't tell you that was an engine. I'll drop something, and I'll go, ooh, you're like, ooh, you know? So. You also told me holding a flashlight, and Dad's raising his hand. See him squint his eyes. I didn't know as a child that when Dad would say, hold the flashlight, and he's working on something over here, that the flashlight needed to be on what he was looking at, not his face. <laughs> so many times, the flashlight would just migrate back to his face. He's like, oh, I, need it right. I don't know why I did that, but I still remember that. I know that's where he was thinking about People need to have some kind of, you might even instill an, an interest in what they're, they're trying to show them. I know, I hate to have Tim to come out and help on something. I know she needs to know, like if she's on the road, if your fan belt came on, well, if she was close to the auto zone, she could just stop and they could put it on the floor if she could, or change a flat and things. But I, I've caused her to be sick a lot because when she comes out, I've got a headache, you got it here. But, but it's the same way when I go in the house and she wants to show me how to use the washing machine. You can't do that. I don't know how that works. I catch the washing machine, but I won't use it. There's a lot of difference there. So you have to have an interest and you have to instill that interest sometimes. Yeah. So live by example, uh, make it interesting. As far as, as far as work ethic in, our, in their children, Heather and I are going to. We are not going to give an allowance. He will be, we will in the sense that he's going to be allowed to have clothes on his back, food in his belly, and a roof over his head. But he's not going to just get $20 for, just for being there. <laughs> That's not going to happen. He's going to have things that he's supposed to do that are applicable to his age and his abilities. And, you know, we'll work up to mowing the grass, but right now it's putting away silverware, putting stuff in the dishwasher, things that he can reach, and we're working up, and then you will be. You will earn that, and you will get the reward from that. I know everybody's seen either the email or the words where it says in the national parks, please do not feed the bears. Mm -hmm. It makes them lazy and dependent and aggressive if they're not, you know? There's a lot, there's a lot to that. Yep. Discussion question number three in closing and in relation to that. How can Christians respond to those seeking help who refuse to work? Loving manner, but they need to know that they're in the wrong and you're not just going to deal with a, a sponge. Yeah, you're, we're not enablers. Right? You, don't, you shouldn't <coughs> help enable them to not do that. Thank you all very much.